It is of God that we are in Christ. It is his love that paid the price. He is our wisdom and righteousness. We are redeemed to innocence. So let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who hopes, hope in his word. God is faithful, he will not fail. Of God are we in Christ. So let us draw near in full assurance of faith. We are fully reconciled, all this because of grace. So let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who hopes, hope in his word. God is faithful, he will not fail. Of God are we in Christ. It is of God that we are in Christ. Sing together. Of God are we in Christ. It is his love that paid the price. He is our wisdom and righteousness. We are redeemed to innocence. Our boast is, so let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who hopes, Hope in his word, God is faithful, he will not fail. Of God are we in Christ, of God are you in Christ, amen. Deep within me, I know the truth, though sometimes hidden, it's never hard to find. I just listen, and I have found your voice like a whisper. But always so profound And I know You are with me And I know You are for me I know Yes, I know What I might hear No feelings, no doubt, no fear Would ever separate me From the knowledge of your love Cause I know You are with me And I Greater than your confirmations There are no lies more persuasive than your truths There are no voices louder than yours Crying within me Abba Father You are for me. Oh. 
Now there are no contradictions greater than your confirmations. There are no lies more persuasive than your truth. There are no voices louder than yours crying within me. Abba Father, I am You know, if you take the Greek word for peace, <coughs> it means prosperity. And I said, Lord, you know, <coughs> what does prosperity have got to do with peace? Because that means that the people in Zimbabwe cannot have peace. You know, um, and that if you don't have money, you cannot have peace. Because peace means prosperity. Go and check it in the Greek. Strong's Concordance, it says prosperity, the first word, then a full stop, and then some other things means prosperity and I said God what is that and then this is the voice that came to me the, the, the understanding peace is the emotion of somebody is it on vessel peace is the emotion of somebody that knows he's got no more debts <laughs> hallelujah <coughs> that's, pro that's why it says prosperity because if you've got, that's why people want more money because they want peace because they don't want to have debt. Listen, man, if you've got debt that you cannot pay, and that's what the law is. The law is a debt you cannot pay. And you know this thing's end is death. And they're knocking at your door. You don't have peace. And peace is that emotion when they could come to you and say, listen, you're not, you don't have any debt anymore. Oh, hallelujah. Bless God, you know. You know, um, what we said about finances today and, and the vision that I have in sharing this message is so, is so that people can start to believe God again. That's all. Just believe in who He is. Faith is not something we do to get God to do something for us. Faith is a persuasion of what He's done for us. Amen. And it comes by the hearing of the Word. It comes by the hearing of the Logos or the logic of God. If you start to listen to the logic of God, what's logic to God? I mean, it's, it's just logic to Him, normal to Him that your needs are met in Christ. That's just logic. It's, it's, he's not confused about it. He's not worried about it. It's not something that's going to change. or anything. He knows that's, that's logical to Him because His Son became poor so that you can become rich through His poverty and through what He's done for you. Um, if you ask Jesus what he thinks about your financial prosperity, what do you think will he say? Because he went through all that suffering. You know, Jesus and God is so concerned about our provision and our well-being that when he was hanging upon the cross, bearing the sin of the whole world, wounded and having pain that no man can ever think on or even fathom, then he looked at his mother and he was worried where she will stay. <laughs> and he said to John, John, this is your mother and this is your son. He was worried about caring for his own mother. While he was bearing the sin of the world, so many other things to think of. Pain and agony and, and all that. He was worried about that. So I want to tell you that in that he was having the exact same emotion concerning you. And he foreknew you. Therefore, when he was hanging there, he was preparing a place for you. Not just um, in the heavens like we think of having this house in heaven. You know that teaching of having a big house and small house in heaven? <laughs> Man. <laughs> that's another thing that we must sort out tonight. Because th that's nonsense. 
You know, one day a guy came to me, he said to me, Bertie, you know, you're going to work in my garden in heaven. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I said to him, why? And then he said, he, he, he read this one book about this one preacher. You know, a big preacher, um, well known in the world. And, and it's all about, um, you know, how you must have good works before God. And he said to me, you know, you're a grace preacher. You don't preach works. And by that, he, he, he was implying that I've got nothing good. You know, no good works. And then um, he, said, um, he said to me, so those good works are like building blocks that you send to heaven. And then God started to build this house for you, you know. Well, the angels. I mean, God's just seated. So the angels are just <laughs> building this house for you. And he said to me, you know what? This guy in this book wrote, the heaven is like, you know, you get the outskirts. That's like the, the Africa bush. And they're the people live in the bush. And those, they are those that didn't send up a lot, but they at least believe in Jesus. You know, so they made it to heaven. And they're living in the bush. See, you're laughing, but that guy sold millions of copies of that book. I tell you, he did. So, and then um, he said, then, you know, the guys that sent some stuff, at least there, there was some mud huts. They only sent mud. <laughs> and then it went further on with bricks and everything until the big houses. So he says, what do you think about this? So I wasn't, I didn't want to mock him because he's serious. I mean, this guy's serious. I said, no, I'll go and think about it. I'll come back tomorrow. Man, God gave me a wonderful answer. So I was thinking about this and I got a vision. And I saw in this vision this dirt road, you know, going to the gates of heaven. And I tried to reach it, but I couldn't. And it was hot. It was like 45 degrees Celsius. And I fell into this, in, in this road in the dust. And I just said, well, in this vision, well, I'm not going to make it. I can't even reach the gate. And I, I was lying down like this. And while I was lying in the heat, just giving up, somebody came to me and just kicked me like that. He says, hey, wake up, man. And he took me by the hand, picked me up. And it was Jesus. He says, I want to show you something. And, you, and that was just how we talked. Like, I want to show you something. And he walked, walked through the gates, you know. The moment he was there, that heat was gone. I felt strength. I went through the gates. And you know, just as he said, that other guy, there was the outskirts. <laughs> and there was the mud huts. And we were just walking and he showed me all these things, you know. And then we came <laughs> to bigger houses and bigger houses and eventually to this massive palace. And, he, and I said to him, man, Jesus, whose house is that? And Jesus said, no, that was his house. And then he said, well, you know, I've got so many rooms. Don't you want to come and live with me? Said, Isn't that awesome? So I said to him, Jesus prepared a place for me. Hallelujah. And I said to him, you know, brother, are you going to work in Jesus' garden? <laughs> I mean, there's a room for you as well if you want to live there. Since I don't have my own house, you can't see that I will stay in the bush. So he prepared a place for us. Amen. That's just a simple exp explanation of this gospel. So we must know that he prepared a place for us. When it comes to finances, he's prepared a place for us of absolute peace. And anything that wants to take that peace away, let the peace of God, the peace of God, not your peace, the peace that God has about you, guard your heart when it comes to the teaching of finances. Is God out of peace? If, I, if, if, if my financial situation is not stable, according to the worldly standards, is God going to lose His peace because I haven't um, sown or, or given a tithe or anything like that? No, God's peace is stable. If God must change His personality every time people do something wrong, He will have a split personality of six point something billion. Because He'll have a mixed emotion with every person and what every person does wrong. You know, with, with wrong teaching, we get a wrong idea of God. You know, when, we, um, when I talk about God willing to give His Son, or somebody teaches about, um, you know, sin and how God acted, all of those things are actually teaching us who God really is. That's what it does. Then we, 
when we see who He is, that nature, if it's correctly portrayed, and I believe it is through what happens in this conference here, when it's correctly portrayed, then it promotes belief in our heart. And I've said it this way and, and, um, in, that, in, in a series on faith, is that, now, now listen to me and, and don't be shocked in what I say, but just hear what I say, I'll explain it. You cannot believe. Belief is something that happens to you. It's a result of something. I cannot, you know, if I look at, uh, uh, at somebody that has cheated me, that, has, that, I mean, they stole my money, they lied to me all the time, I cannot believe in that person. It's impossible. Even if I try, I cannot. The only thing that I do, if I say I really believe in him, it's a simple, mere confession of emptiness which is a lie. There's no substance to it. It's when you... Belief is, uh, is when you get enough information together about the character of a person that it goes over into a rest in your mind. That's belief. That's why I say you cannot work up belief. It's impossible. You cannot work it up. It's something that happens to you when you see the true character and nature of God. So when we hear things about God concerning finances, it must be belief-promoting. I cannot believe in, some, believe in somebody and rest my mind in his integrity, in his friendship with me, in his, his, his justice and who he is, if, it is so, if he's so nitpicking that if I don't do something right, then he cannot bless me. I cannot believe in somebody that he will provide financially for me if he's willing to give his son for free, but it's so hooked up with money that he cannot give that for free as well. If somebody is willing to give his son, let's look at normal life. If he's willing to give his son, but he's not willing to give money, that guy's got a problem. He's got a problem with money. I tell you, he's not going to give that away, my friend. And you can trust that. No, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and I want to just use this example to explain to you what we have started to believe about who God is concerning finances, although it's got nothing to do with finances. 1 John 1, verse 9 and 10 says, If you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And um, I remember at Bible school I was thinking, you know, that this was taught to me, that not, not just by, but by many preachers, this is how it was. If you confess your sin, then only... Will God now forgive you? Okay, so, um, and then after He's now forgiven you, He'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness, and then you better watch it, because God, God is gracious, but you don't mess with Him. And you've got to now live right. And then one day, I, you know, I looked at that scripture, and I said, well, that's, if that's the way God is, that's fine. You know, then we do it that way. And um, that was before I got a hold of grace. And when I got a hold of grace, I spoke to somebody about it. And he said to me, listen, you, uh, um, you, you, know, you need to confess every sin. I said to him, no, man. Th that's not it. And he says, yes, that scripture says that. And I said to him, okay, well, we, you know, he didn't want to hear what I had to say. So we left it like that. And then about three weeks later, they broke into my house. And they stole a lot of stuff. So I went to this guy and I said to him, you know what? I'm not forgiving that guy. And he said to me, you shall forgive him because you're a deacon in the church. I said to him, no, I'm not better than God. He must first confess. <laughs> As I see my heavenly father do, so I do. I, I'm, not, I'm not forgiving him. He, I mean, who am I to say that I can forgive without somebody even asking forgiveness, lifting my righteousness higher than that of God? No ways. He must confess. <laughs> I'm waiting. And then, you know, if I see the guy in the street and the car hit him and he's not completely dead and there comes a big truck and he's in the road, you know, I cannot help him because my hands are chopped off or he's got unconfessed And then I will teach my children's children to persecute and murder out his kids until the third and fourth generation. <laughs> because that is the God I serve. 
and I trust Him with my life. <laughs> I mean, how can you trust a person that's like that? That character does not promote trust. It doesn't promote belief. That's what also what happened concerning finances. When it comes to money, people's hearts get gripped into such fear. Because what they've heard about God concerning money does not produce any faith. And faith can only be produced by the word of the good news of Jesus Christ, which is the message of the cross, the message of God incarnated into human flesh, obeying on our behalf, dying on our behalf, being resurrected on our behalf, and forever having immortal human flesh, meaning my representative and my life, forevermore. If you cannot put money in that, you cannot believe anything concerning money. You will only have to go to seminars where they give you uh, um, uh, 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 skills on how to cope with fear. That's all. But you will not be set free. That's why we need to apply the gospel. Now, that scripture in, 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 in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, I'm sure somebody else has preached about that here. It simply means to, to say the same thing about your sin as what God says about your sin. So if you struggle with a drinking problem and you think this thing is too much for you, then you go and you say, alcohol, I just want to tell you something. I want to confess um, uh, what God says about you. I have been set free from you and I've got... You've got no hold on me. That's confession of sin, to say the same thing as. Now, we're not going to say the same thing as what sin says. We're going to say the same thing as what God says. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we have been born of God. Right. Now, um, let's go to First uh, Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter six. <clears throat> I want to say to you as, as as church leaders, you know, maybe you've been preaching, sowing and reaping, tithing in your church, and you feel you can feel condemned because you felt that that was the wrong thing I do. I want to tell you there's no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. Man, look up and go on. Just preach the truth. You know, thank you, God, this is, this is over, you know, and uh, it's something of the past. You've overlooked my ignorance, and I continue with the gospel of grace. Amen. Finished. We don't, don't throw a pity part and feel bad for two weeks and try and find five scriptures to justify the way you have believed. Man, you know this is the truth. Just go with it. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's like somebody said to me, Berti, are you the only person on the planet that believes this? I said, no, me and God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I'm sure some of the angels will believe it. And you know, all those that didn't believe it, that died, they also believing it now. So why will I set for a minority to join the minority of just 4 billion people or 6 billion people that believes the lie? I'm not going to, I'm going to believe what God believes about finances. He's met my needs in Christ Jesus, free from my works. Hallelujah. All right. Verse, verse 4. It says here, oh, let, let's read from verse 3. It says, if any man teach otherwise, this is First Timothy chapter 6 from verse 3. If any man teaches otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, <clears throat> the most godly thing that could ever have happened was the manifestation of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof comes envy, strife, railings, evil, submissings. Um, perverse disputes of men of corrupt minds. Now we're getting to finances. Destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself. Supposing that gain is godliness. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's it. Okay. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. <laughs> 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 
and having food and clothes. Let us be there with content. Man. But they that want to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drawn men into destruction and perdition for the love of money. What's the love of money? They that want to be rich. Is the root of all evil. Which while saw some co coveted after money, they wanted more. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now listen man, you can't get it more straight than that. You know, you don't actually have to preach about that scripture. It just preaches for itself. <laughs> Supposing that gain is godliness. Listen, leaders, I want to tell you, the amount of money you have is not the measure of godliness. It's not the measure by which you measure your godliness. And it has been preached that way. I've seen it that way. You know, the size of ministries... And all those type of things, you know, the bigger the ministry, the greater the miracles, the, all that. And then when it comes to finances, you know, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm so, uh, I came to a place where I got tired of going to seminars where um, the leaders look at with what car you arrive. Man, I remember this one guy, I didn't, somebody blessed me with, with a car, a very nice car. And that time it was fairly new, one of these Ford Falcons. Very nice car. Four liter, powerful thing. So, um, this guy, he, and, and I came, I had an, a, an old Ford. So I went with an old Ford to the church. So I said to my wife, watch this guy now. I'm going with an old Ford. <laughs> so I went with an old Ford. You know, he just like, yeah, la, 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 you know. After the first break, I went, I fetched the other car. I come with the other car. Hey, brother! Is that your car? I said, yes. He said, hey, man! You know, all of a sudden he wants to chat to me. <laughs> Supposing gain is godliness. No, no. Financial gain is no measure of godliness. There's one thing that made us godly, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And that is our godliness. And that's how we see godliness. And we don't look at people according to the flesh anymore. Anyway, we look at them through the eyes of Jesus Christ and see their value, the way God sees people's value. Amen. Amen. The fact that somebody has not come to the faith, you know, and is still living in sin and all those type of things doesn't take his value away. If my car gets stolen, is it all of a sudden not worth anything? It's got the same worth. It's just lost. I just don't know where it is. It's just lost, but it's still worth that money. And if I go to the insurance company, they're going to pay me out what it's worth, even if it's lost. Because that's its worth. Amen. So we don't look, you know, at people from that perspective. And this is what he says here. There are people that have come that have erred from the truth. Now listen, my definition of truth, I studied truth and, and um, I took John chapter 4 where Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, and He says that there will come a time when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and that time is now. So, so that means that before Jesus came, they didn't worship in truth. So truth had something to do with Jesus. So many times people think Jesus came, you know, when Jesus came, we saw the glory of God, full of grace and truth, and then they take the truth as rules and regulations and the law, full of grace and the law. Now mixing the two. No, no, that's not what it means. Truth, the definition of truth, the Bible says that true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit with a small s and truth. And then you go to Hebrews chapter 10. It says the true worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. So truth is no consciousness of sin. Hallelujah. Amen. There are people, <coughs> there are people that has become destitute of the message of no consciousness of sin. And they, they are measuring people up by, and you, we do it with ourselves so many times. We are conscious of sin. Therefore, we say, this, if I have this amount or, or if I have that amount, it means that I'm right or wrong with God. No, it doesn't mean that. And Paul says, get away from, from that type of, 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 of teaching. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And that word gain there it also means financial gain. <laughs> so just godliness, the, the revelation of grace, 
that flows over into a life where you experience the emotion of, I'm so happy with what God has given me. You know what contentment does? Contentment makes what you have today of God. Now let me explain that. Contentment makes what you have today of God. How can a car or, or a shirt you wear today be of God and two weeks from now or six months from now that shirt is now from the devil because it's old? <laughs> so where does it come from? You know? No. What I have today because I believe that God meets my needs in Christ Jesus. Whatever I have today comes of God and I'm happy with it and it brings gratitude in my heart because I see that I'm not blessed through my works and God gives it to me freely. I'm happy with this. I see it as of God. I've, I've seen people go through their whole life even to the point where they die and they always want to reach that great thing that God wants to give them and God blesses them all their life but they can't see what God has given them because they're always chasing that more. Never enjoying the right. I've been driving like that to Zambia, man. Looking so forward to get to the place where we're going to preach that I don't even enjoy going past Vic Falls. <laughs> because all you want to see is that thing there, you know. And when you get there, it's not always as you intended. Then you think on, then you're longing back for the wife again at home. Now you must get home again. No, you, you, I mean, we can't live like that. Contentment is something that, that you can't work up. It's something that comes out of a revelation. The moment you start to believe, this, you know, when you get into the thing that finances was upon the cross, one of the fruits that come through that belief is contentment. And one of the other things, listen, my friend, is long-suffering. <laughs> that is one of the best things there is, is long-suffering. You know, if you don't ha have long-suffering, you suffer when you suffer. But if you have long-suffering, you don't suffer when you suffer. If you have contentment, listen, God said, I will, you know, this shirt, I will not have it next year anymore. If I must have it next year anymore, bless God. But just who the Father is. I mean, that's just who He is. I will have another one. It's just who He is. He can't help Himself. That's just who He is. It's because we rest in who He is. Amen. That's why everything, when you get it, you're so happy for it. I'm happy with the people that work in the ministry. I'm happy with the wife I have. I'm happy with the car I drive, the house I stay in. Man, I'm even happy with the dogs I've got. <laughs> really. It brings a change of mind to you. You know, I drove an old Audi that had 420,000 kilometers on the clock. You know, I was, when I, when I saw that as of God, when I got this revelation of grace, you know what was in my mind? I was thinking, you know, I only paid about 12,000 rand for this car. And it's got an aircon, no climate control. It's got speed crews that works. <laughs> Electric windows. It's a big car. It's got a big boot. My kids can sit comfortably in it. And then I drove around thinking of the other guys. I can't understand why they don't want to buy cars like this doesn't cost a lot of money. It's, I mean, to fix something on it, maybe something breaks to fix it, is much less than one month's payment on a new one. And doesn't break every month. So, man. So, it changes your whole way of thinking. You can become happy after all. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and then when you see again, you know, one day... Uh, that car broke down, and then I said, well, car, I'm pushing you into the garage now because you're braking all the time, and God gives me reliable transport, and I know my feet is not going to break down, so I'll walk. <laughs> Thank God. I did that. 
And do, do you know what? W when you're into the grace message concerning finances, you don't feel humiliated then. You are happy. Other people can't understand it. Sometimes you can't understand it yourself. But you just feel that joy in your heart because my Father has met all my needs. My value is not according to the money that I have. Paul was in jail. Poor, making many rich. Hallelujah. Amen. And you, 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 you can, this doesn't matter what you own, you can walk as a righteous man and woman of God with dignity and worth. Even if your car is pushed into the garage. A week later, somebody came. Said to me, Bertie, now listen, listen to what contentment does. He says, go and buy a car up to 100,000. I bless you. I saw one for 60, which I liked. Then I bought that one. Why must I buy the one with 100,000? I must now cut it to the edge as if God will never again. <laughs> no. No, I like this one. Do you know? It was that Falcon, four liter, nice and powerful, everything. I could have gone to 100,000, I got that for 60. The guy didn't say to me, well, here's 40 cash. I don't care. I wanted this one. Now, maybe you want the one with 100,000. It doesn't matter. Because contentment gives you when you believe the truth about the gospel, when you can put finances in the cross, you know what you will find? You'll find integrity coming into your life. Things you can't work up. You can't work up integrity. It's a fruit of belief. It's a fruit of a revelation of what Christ has done in finances. Amen? So we don't have to go into five lessons in how to have integrity in the church. Because it is born into man. Hallelujah. Man, if you don't enjoy this, I enjoyed myself. <laughs> Verse 7. It says, For we brought nothing into this world, and this thing we are certain of, we can carry nothing out. And having listened, man, this is one of the greatest scriptures concerning money. It says, And having food and clothes, let us therewith be content. <clears throat> now, then I said, God, don't you think that's li a little bit little? I mean, just food and clothes. Not even talking about a house here, you know. We're just talking about food and clothes sleeping under the bush. And I said, God, why only food and clothes? Know what he said to me? So that everybody can realize how blessed they are. It's only God that can say that. Because everybody here has got more than food and clothes. So that you can start to walk as a blessed of God. Seeing what you've got more so that your eyes can be on the blessing of God. So that you cannot feel less than another person. Because man, hallelujah, I've got three jackets, two pairs of shoes, Two pairs of pants. It's more than just one. God, you blessed me. Free from my works. Hallelujah. I was even under the law and I got this more. Wow. <laughs> so I want to tell you guys, if you live in Africa, up in Africa, and, and, and there's, there's poverty and those type of things, don't let the Western world, don't look at their, what they've got and you think you're poor. You're not poor. You're the blessed of God. You, you, you've got more than clothes. You've got more than simple, just food. You've got more than that. You're the blessed of God. Amen. Let no man say you are poor. One day a man came to me and he gave me clothes. And when he gave me that clothes, I saw he gave it to me because he feels sorry for me. I couldn't take it. <laughs> Don't feel sorry for me. I'm God's son. <laughs> Amen. I'd rather walk with, 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 with shoes where my toes stick out, but with dignity, than you feeling sorry for me. 
Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible doesn't say, and God felt so sorry for the world that He gave His Son. No, He loves the world. Amen. He sees worth in the world. Don't give me something because you think, oh, you know, this poor guy, yes, he's got just nothing, you know, well, let me help him out here while God cannot. No ways. We don't take that. I want to say to you guys, man, that there was a time when I was so poor, it's like the one American preacher said, I'm so poor I can't even pay attention. I've got nothing. Man. There, there was times like that, but let me tell you, in those times is when I got this revelation. It was in those times that I got this revelation. I went down to a church in Bredastorp. They said to me, Bertie, the guy came there. I said to him, I want to come down to your church. He said to me, oh, but remember, I can't pay you. I said, I didn't ask for money. He says, I'm just coming to serve you, brother. Just, I don't care. I didn't come there for money because my God's not dead. And we can trust in the person of God. And here he says, he gives us, he says, if you've got food and clothes, there with be content. But they that want to be rich, now listen, they that want to be rich can be a rich man or a poor man. Want to be rich is saying, I am not rich, I want to be rich. And if you want to be rich, it means that you, like I said, you, you, you don't see the prosperity in the cross which has freely been given to you. You don't see that. But Bertie, I need more money. God knows that. Thank God for that. I remember there was a time, let me give some practical thing. There was a time when I said to God, God, you know, I want to go and preach in Ikacheng, a, a, a township just outside Potchester. And, um, you know, I need, a, I need a travel there, you know. And then God said to me, use your bicycle. Oh, okay, I use the bicycle. Then I went, I said, God, but sometimes I want to go at night. I need a car. He says, use your bicycle. So I used the bicycle, and after a while I got a car. Not because I used the bicycle. It's just to God, God was just lining stuff up, you know, and it maybe take some time. Because some people need to hear and listen and obey and give the thing. And can, can maybe take them a week or two, you know. So then I, I got a car. Then I started to complain because I don't have a sound system. <laughs> so God said, what's wrong with your voice? I said, nothing, Lord. He says, preach, man. So I preached, and after a while I got a sound system. Then I was very upset because I didn't have a tent. <laughs> and I said, Lord, oh, no. it, it was first, first the four by four thing. I said, for Lord, uh, and I was upset. I said, and then I was starting to preach in Mozambique. And I, and I said, um, Lord, you know, I, I'm preaching in Mozambique, you know. As if he was not there. I'm preaching in Mozambique and, uh, you know, I need a 4x4. Four four. He says, what's wrong with your car? I says, can't go in the thick sand. He says, then you go until there where it can go. And you preach there. <laughs> and that's how we went. I didn't have money for a, for a stage, for a plank, so I took my bed's plank that I slept on, took that off, and then put it on the trailer, and then I stand on that thing and I preach the gospel. And then when I get home, I take it back, put it on the bed, then I sleep. <laughs> People didn't know that. I knew that. People were seeing the man of God, you know. They see the pictures of 3,000 people. That time, let me tell you, that time with that old car that broke down 19 times and 200 kilometers, that car and, and, and that stage and whatever, we shared the gospel to about 10 to 15,000 people a day in Maputo. A day. Seeing the, seeing the signs and wonders and miracles and everything. But the thing is, if, if my mind was on what I don't have, I would have sat at home and do nothing. So I want to tell you, you are rich. Just look at what you have. The, 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 the deceptive prosperity of the Western world can deceive you not to see your own riches that you can use right there where you are. Paul never had a sound system. He just preached. And his voice is still echoing today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I said I, I'm preaching on, on the internet. You know this message that is, is broadcasted live right now to, all over the world. And if, if I must go home today, if I must go to heaven today, do you know what? They will continue to broad, rebroadcast that until my children's children's children. Amen. And this gospel will continue to be preached. You know, and that is a very cheap medium to preach the gospel. Let me tell you that. It's not expensive. It's very cheap. So I want to tell you guys, when, when we can see that we brought nothing into this world, we can take nothing out of this world, then we will not put our value on all these possessions. Okay? But he that wants to be rich, that's where I was, but he that wants to be rich, what happens if you want to be rich? You are tempted. What is temptation? Temptation is a drawing to get back under the law. That's what temptation is. So now you don't have money. <clears throat> now the, the best plan that Satan can use, and let me do it this way, and, and show you how Satan can use words. I can say to you this way. You know, my brothers, God wants you to have more money. He wants you to be very, very rich. You know what? He wants to transfer the wealth of the wicked unto you. That's the voice of the devil. You say, because the intent of that is to create a need in your heart. It's to create a need in your heart. If you go and reach it, that scripture which says, the wealth of the wicked is transferred to the righteous, it has already happened in Christ. Because the wicked were those that saw justification by the law and sowing and reaping and tithing and all that they were chasing after through their systems has been given to me in Christ. Now that can make some people upset. But they tell you, that is God's honest truth. It's been given to us and it creates a need. And once that need is created in your heart, you say, I desire that. The moment you desire that, then I can come with my plan on how you can get it and I, if I'm clever enough, can benefit out of it. And there are people that have been deceived into that, not willingly knowing what they were doing. But that was what happened, and the effect of that, if, you know, listen, if I don't intend to ride over somebody with my car, do you know what's going to happen, if, even if it wasn't willful? That guy is going to die. So even if it wasn't willful, the effect is exactly the same. That's why it's so important for us not to continue with this law message and to get out of it and to say, Lord, renew our minds. Bertie has spoken about this, Lord, but I don't want to just take everything he says. You speak to me, my God. Yeah. Amen. Right. I'm not scared to tell you, listen, God can go and talk to God about this because he will tell you what he told me. Amen. Then you will say the guy was right. <laughs> Verse 10. For the love... For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now that sounds so, oh, man, just the context here is the love of something. Having, having a desire for something you think you don't have. Out of that is the root where the law comes in and then evil starts to come out of that. Because the moment you get like that, it's like the one guy, um, I heard him uh, speak and he said, you know, um, somebody came to him and said, listen, I've, sighed, I've sowed, I've reaped, I've tithed, I've done everything, you know. I've worked all the principles. Now for 10 years in your church and, 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 and pastor, it doesn't work. You know what he answered her? He said, the Bible says all the laws and all the prophets hang on these two things. So what he it, what it then said is, is, is like, a, a, um, let's say there's two points here and I've got something that... That's over here like a stick. Gordijn stok. A curtain rail. A curtain rail. It's got those two hooks that it hangs on. Okay? And this curtains hang on there. And then all the law and all the prophets, you know, hangs on that. All the laws. In other words, all the principles is founded on these two things. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And then he asked her, have you loved your neighbor as yourself? She said, no, sometimes I fail. She says, that's why your principle doesn't work. I mean, you can just never be good enough. You can just never feel that you've qualified. You can just never feel that God just loves me. God just loves me. You know, I was, 
There was time when I had such, let me put it this way, a, a, a need for money in the ministry to go and preach in places. Then God gave me a thing like a radio-controlled car. Or a motorbike. That's got nothing to do with the ministry. <laughs> and what he's saying to me is, listen man, I, am, I want you to be happy. I want to bless you. I want you to feel that abundance. I want you to feel special, man. I want to show my love to you. Hallelujah. Right, let's go to one other scripture quickly. Man. Are you going to slaughter me if I go over the time? No, it's worth it. Because I've got things here, man. Uh, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 7. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to read there from verse... Must actually, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on this chapter. We're also going to talk about 2 Corinthians, um, where it speaks of sowing and reaping. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you will, you, you will reap bountifully. We can talk about that. You need to understand the whole chapter and the back, background of three or four chapters to understand what's written there. Okay, right. <clears throat> the context of Hebrews chapter 7 was um, the writer of the book of Hebrews, let's say it's Paul, comes and he wants to establish um, the priesthood of Jesus Christ in the hearts of people, saying that the priesthood of Melchizedek was higher than the, than the order of Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. That's what he tries to say in, in, in Hebrews chapter 7. Okay, so now we're going to read it. It says, for this Melchizedek, let's start with verse 1. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram after the turning of the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abram gave tenth part of all, first king by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. Now, consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. So, what is he trying to say? Is he trying to say we must tithe to Jesus? No, no, he's just trying to say that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. That's all that he tries to say. Because they were saying, they were thinking differently. They were thinking Abraham was greater than Moses. And then Moses was greater than Aaron, and Aaron was greater than the Levites. And then they, in, in that order, they, they said, no, how can Jesus now, that comes not even out of Levi, but out of the tribe of Judah, be greater than even a Levite? So how can he be the Messiah? That's he, that's he's trying to explain here. Okay. He's not trying to teach you how to give. <laughs> and another thing, Jesus never took up a tithe. He never. Do you know why? Because if he did it, he would have broken the law. Because he would have been stealing. Because the tithe went to the Levites, not the people from Judah. And he was not of the tribe of Levi. So he could never do it. Okay. So, um, and he's, he, he never did it when he was on earth, and he's not going to do it now. He never changes. He stays the same. <clears throat> he's, he's, he's in a different order. He works, and I'm not saying that God cannot accept something you come and give out of a pure heart. I'm not saying that. Please hear. I'm not saying don't give. I'm not saying that. Listen, man, I'm a preacher. Uh, how will we have money if, we, if people don't give money? That's it. But to put a, a force upon people, that's wrong. You know, and to, to, to manipulate people to do that, that's wrong. I'm not against people giving money. All that I say is that we are not for manipulation and control and the law. Because that produces death in the lives of people. Okay? So and I'm not saying that you cannot decide. If you want to decide, I want to give 10% a month. Man, why do you want to give 10%? Please make it nine and a half or ten and a half, man. But get away from that ten that you can just get free. You know? <laughs> Yo. <laughs> 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 
right. <laughs> Verse 4. It says, Now consider how great this man was. <laughs> it says, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abram gave a tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of priesthood, listen to this now, have a commandment. Say commandment. To take tithes of the people according to the law. Now, is a tithe under the law or not? Let me read it again. I see some don't have the revelation. It says, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Okay, are you under the Levitical priesthood? If you are, you must pay tithes to Levi. But you're not. You're under the priesthood of Melchizedek. Was there a tithe taken up from, from Abraham to Melchizedek according to the law? No. Abraham honored the greatness. The greatness of the priest that was willing to bless him even if he had already received. And out of that honor he gave. That, 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 that I call giving born of God. Okay. But it was not according to the law. Here we see where the law comes in. And that was the Levitical priesthood. That is where we get the whole tithe thing from in Deuteronomy. And we get it from in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 speaks about this. You know, giving to the Levites. Tithing according to the Old Testament. And blessed him, <coughs> sorry, um, verse 5, And they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of priesthood, have a commandment to take up tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So what he was actually saying is, the descendants of Abraham had to pay tithes to the Levites, making the Levites in standard lower than Abraham. So he's trying to prove something here. He said they were, those people had a law to give to the Levites. When Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, then Levi was still in the loins of Abraham, making Levi lower than Abraham. Making Melchizedek still the highest. Okay? Which is Christ, in whom we are. Amen. Right. By whose descent... Okay, but, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men, here men receive tithes. So many people as, as, as translate that as the church. Here in the church, men receive tithes. No, here in the Levitical priest order, people receive tithes. But there... He received them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. What does that mean? What does he try to say? He doesn't say we must give tithes. He's trying to say that that one that is alive, then that is witnessed that he's still alive, which is Jesus, is greater than Abraham, greater than the law system, greater than Moses. And then he goes on to say that we are now in that priestly order. That is Christ's order and we are in him. And that makes us free from the law. That's what it tries to prove in, in chapter 7. But let's go on. It says, And as, as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. Now listen. Levi received tithes. He didn't pay tithes. He received tithes. But he paid tithes in Abraham. So he never gave a tithe, but he paid a tithe when Abraham paid a tithe. If Abraham could pay his tithe on his behalf, don't you think Jesus could do it for us? Sure. Okay, it's just something you can think of. <clears throat> do you think that? It's just, it's, I think it's possible. For he was yet um, in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection, listen to this, were by the Levitical priesthood. If you think perfection is by the Levitical priesthood concerning your finances. I want to tell you, you're wrong. Perfection in your financial blessing can never come through sowing and reaping or tithing. 
You can never be perfectly blessed and prosperous in your money through tithing. Listen to what verse 11 says. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise, according to the prophets, after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed... Listen to this. There is made of necessity a change also of the law. And what law does that talk about? As well, includes the law that you receive tithes. And you must pay tithes. He says if there was a change of priesthood, then there's a change of law. There was a tithing law, but that now has changed. And we are under what I call the free will offering. Amen. And we freely give by the nature of God. And I want to tell you, when, when I first studied these things, it was liberating unto me. But as a pastor, and, and it has been removed from me now, but as a pastor I had fear in my mind because where am I going to get money? Because I knew the people didn't want to give. I don't want to give. Man, I don't even want to give. <laughs> I'm the man with the revelations and I am stingy. Now what about them? How will I live? I want to tell you, I dare you to preach this gospel because the glory as revealed by the Spirit far outweighs the glory of the law. What this, you know, if I, if I look at what I possess, let's get practical here, if I look at what I own in this world, and I see it, it's holy to me. Do you know why? Because it came, it, it, it costed Christ to get that. And I didn't produce that. But God gave it in Christ. And it didn't come out of the works of the flesh. It didn't come out of manipulation or the tithing system or re-implementing a law system that I can look at something and say, you know, actually in the back of my mind I must say, this is my hard work that has done this. This is my good preaching, my persuading the people, my, me making them afraid enough to give enough. If you must make people afraid to give something, you must keep them afraid to keep giving. And do you want people full of fear? No. If you tell people, listen, you must give, you, you must, if, if you get money out of telling people, listen, if you give, if, if you give you're going to get, you must always tell them that they are poor, so that you can tell them again, you must give, so that you can get, so that you can have something. No. No. We can teach our people and tell them about the unconditional love of God. Let generosity arise in their hearts. You know, and like Paul told, told the people that already prospered and were blessed and said to them, listen man, you know, enjoy your money. Don't forget the poor. That they could come and in remembrance of what God has done and remembering the generosity of God that God was willing to give His Son. You know, thinking that I am in the very likeness, in the very image. Do you know why I don't drink myself drunk? Because it doesn't fit with me. Not, not because there's a law that says you mustn't drink. Because it, it, it doesn't belong with me. It's not who I am. Do you know why I give? Because that's who I am. That, that's God. I, I, I can't help. I found that there's times when I, when I looked at the bank, there's, there's not money. That I will take my credit card and draw money and give it to somebody. Not because there's any law. But the simple love in my heart. Say, man, I want to support that thing. I've done it before. I've done it many times. Do it that way. Give in such a way. Give people money. Because it's the nature of God. Let me tell you something. You can trust the nature of God in your people better than what you can trust 
your control over them. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I just want to explain that scripture. There's one more. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians. Just, I want to just veer a bit away from finances and just share something that we were talking about today. Um, you know the book of Job? I always said, God, you know, that book doesn't belong in the Bible. It doesn't talk about grace. It just talks about a man that did nothing wrong and then God decided to get into a competition <laughs> on the expense of that guy's wife and kids. That's how I saw it. If you must be quite honest. If you read the book of Job, you will see the Bible says Job was a righteous man. Okay? A righteous man. Nothing wrong with him. And then the sons of God came before God. And amongst them came Satan. And then God said, um, Satan. I mean, Satan wasn't even talking about Job. Just minding his own business. <laughs> and then he came and said, Have you considered my son Job? I mean, could God not just have been quiet? Just leave the thing, you know? Just, I mean, let the guy live in peace. Then the, de the devil said something to him. He says, yeah, but you know, it's because of the stuff you've given him and you protect him. He says, no, have a go, let's see. Now, that doesn't make sense to me. I, I, I struggle to trust a person like that. I'm honest, in my heart, I, that's why I would always just skip over that book. Listen, if you don't understand something, read it, and if you still don't understand it, skip it. Yeah. <laughs> Stick with what you understand. And here was the book, here was Job. <laughs> and I was reading Job, and I was going chapter 1, 2, 3, and then when I get there, I said, Lord, I don't see grace. And I read again, and I try to study the scriptures and whatever, and I couldn't get anything. And one night, I... I, I I fell asleep and I had a dream. And in this dream, I was paging through the Bible. And I, through this very Bible in the dream, and I, I saw there written Job. And I paged through Job like that. And I came to the last chapter. And then the pages were just like blowing, you know, through Job like that. And a voice came to me and said to me, don't try and apply the book of Job to your life. Job is a type of Christ. Man, I hope you can hear what I'm saying. Job is a type of Christ. It was a book that Jesus had to fulfill. Do you know that there was, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, there's no one righteous, no, not one, according to the Old Testament. There was no one that could live righteous, not one. But Job was called righteous. So who does he speak of? Jesus. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? And he was righteous and he was concerned about his people sacrificing for them, willing to sacrifice, so that their sins could be covered and taken away. <laughs> Hallelujah. Huh? And then God had a wonderful relationship with Job. And then the devil came in with a law, saying, and then God, you know, God said to Satan, have you considered my son speaking about Jesus? And the devil, listen, the Bible says, and Jesus was led in to the desert by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of the devil. Okay, that doesn't apply to you now. <laughs> Please. I've heard this teaching, you know. After you've been baptized, now God's going to lead you into the desert so that you can be tempted of the devil. <laughs> no, no, wrong. That's not the answer. It speaks of Jesus. It was for Christ. And he was led by the Spirit into the desert for the purpose of being tempted by the devil. And the same happened to Job. Have you considered my Job righteous? Yeah, but do you know what? If you take protection away from him, his sonship is only seated in what you can do for him in protection. Protection-wise and stuff he possesses. God says, no. My sonship in him is my being in him. Not in his possessions. Take it away, you can see. That's what happened with Jesus. 
And he was tempted of the devil in the desert. And what did the devil, how did the devil tempt him? Well, find your sonship in what you can do, in your works. Take this stone and make it a bread. The law was written on stones. Make the law your food. And then you will live. He said, I don't live by the law. I live by what God spoke over me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want to say to you, that book speaks of, I believe with all my heart, it speaks of Job. And when Job was in the hard times, you know what his friends did? They came tempting him with the law all the time. Saying, you know, you did something wrong. You did something wrong. You did something wrong. He said, no. At the end, they brought the sacrifice to him. Because he was the sacrifice. And he said, let him pray for you so that I can forgive your sins. And Job prayed for his friends. And they were forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, amen, man. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> I wanna, and another thing I want to tell you, if you look at the Old Testament and typology, you will never find perfection in typology. Because... Elijah, Job, Moses, no one of those people were the perfect representation of the Father but one, Jesus Christ. So you can leave all the typology and just see what Jesus has done. I mean, that's good enough. It's like the one guy said, you know, he says he, he doesn't want to flirt with the law. He wants to stick with the gospel of grace. He says it's like, you know, the law is just a shadow. It's like a picture. You know, if your wife is in the bedroom, you don't kiss her picture in the living room. <laughs> Amen. We've got something real. Oh, hallelujah. Isaiah. <laughs> Let's go to First Corinthians. Was it Second? First Corinthians. Yes, First Corinthians. Some people have been waiting all the time just for this one. <laughs> no, man. Sorry. Um, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. Second Corinthians 9, verse 6. <clears throat> now, people, we need to understand the context of the Scripture. And uh, you, need to, you can go and study out for yourself. When Paul talks about sowing sparingly and reaping sparingly, he was referring to a scripture in the book of Proverbs where it talks about righteousness. Where it says that the righteousness of the man that gives to the poor remains forever. And when it talks about that righteousness, it doesn't talk about his money. It talks about what the people think of him. And his righteous deed remains in the hearts of the people forever when he gave. Okay, now, <clears throat> to give you background, the, the church in Corinth made a promise. And they said, listen, we will give to the poor churches. You know, and they came, they, they instigated the thing. They said, listen, let's give a lot of money to the poor. So, Paul, you guys, you go away, and then when you come again, you know, we're going to give a lot of money. Or after a while, we're going to send this stuff. And then they were so happy that they testified at other churches about this. And Paul then forgot about the promise. Because, like you will know as a preacher, many of those promises are just empty. When somebody says, I'm going to give it to you, he just lied. You know, he either gives it or he doesn't. I've seen that. You know, don't say, I'm going to. Man, the, the guy either gives it or he doesn't. That's the way it is. And I, and I just want to tell you, you can, you can save yourself a lot of hurt. If somebody say to you, listen, I want to give you this thing. Just do a prayer in your heart. Say, Father... You know, if that is of you, thank you to strengthen him and help him and grace him, that he can do that. Amen. But I don't count on that because if you count on that, you're going to become bitter. You're going to have hurt in your heart because you've made man your source and not the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. You're going to leave. That guy's going to leave, and then he's just because of money, where he could have been hearing the gospel of grace all the time. <clears throat> right. So here, Paul, he just basically left it, forgot about it. You can go and read chapter 8 and 9 about this. And, um, and then the, the poor churches in Macedonia started to give towards the very cause that these people instigated, and now they're not even giving. 
So in other words, like me saying, listen, I promise you, I'm going to give you so much. And then towards this, the poor, and then other years of my action and willingness, that sparks a fire in them, and they say, man, let us also give. And now they start to give, and that church start to give, and that church start to give. And all these people are wanting to know, you know, what did the Corinthians give that are such a rich church? We were, you know, because those things wasn't just a bit of cash in the pocket. It was stuff, man. We're going to take these clothes and, and this maize and this whatever bread and uh, to the people that, that are poor. So now if, you, if the, nothing comes from the Corinthian church, how's that going to look? not going to be good. So now he comes and he says this. Now let's just read there um, from verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is good for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them in Macedonia. You see here he was speaking to other people, and in Achaia, and was ready a year... Um, Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain. In this, very, in, in, in this behalf, that, as I said, you may be ready. Lest, happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. So the people of Macedonia, they were so happy. Grace came upon them. We're going to give. We're going to go with Paul. He was scared that the people of Macedonia, which was so poor, that gave for the cause the people in Corinth started, are going to maybe come with when he must take up what they promised. And then they're going to stand there red-faced looking at each other. The message Bible says. <laughs> we that we say not you, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. So he says, we don't want to stand there ashamed, guys. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as he pur purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So, what does he say here? He says, listen guys, he who gives a little will reap a little. He who gives much will reap much. And then he skips that, and there's a couple of verses in between, and then he explains what he said there. Okay. So he says, listen guys, there are people here that are so excited about this. They're coming with, to take up. I'm actually scared they're going to come with. He's going to try it. They will not come with. But if they now want to come with, what then? So now we're going to take up this money. If you just give a little, you can just get, get a little. If you're going to give much, you're going to get much. But then he talks about how they're supposed to give. So he, he said that, and then just after that, he speaks on how you give. He says, don't give grudgingly. Grudgingly is, man, I don't want to give this, but I give this. Or ne out of necessity. Necessity is not, well, they say I must give, and now I'm giving. That necessity there is mean out of need or want. So don't give because you want. Well, I want more, so now I give. Don't give out of that. Don't give out of a need that God will give to you. Because if you read verse 8, it already talks about the way God provides. You know, so we're going to read on, listen to this. And every man according to his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always, having all sufficiency in all good things, may abound to every good work. So now listen, he's talking about good works and the abounding of good works and the abounding of fruit in their lives. And the abounding of a word about them. So he says, listen man, don't give a little bit. Give as much as what you can. Now listen, let's read. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, 
always, having all sufficiency in all things, that you may abound to every good work. As is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both ministers bread for your food. In other words, if you read the message, it says that God gives seed to the sower, which is then converted into bread for you. He says, and multiply your seed sown, or convert your seed that is sown into the increase of the fruit of your righteousness. So what's the increase that he talks about? Increase of money? No. Whenever he talks about the increase of money, he talks about grace. He says, but God will let all grace abound towards you, so that you can have more money, so that you can give more, so that this giving of you can be converted into the fruit of righteousness. So if I give a little, the righteousness inside me, now listen, you must remember here, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about stinginess. If I just give a little, but I could have given more, the fruit of my righteousness, which is seen by the church of Macedonia that's coming here, will just be a little. And you go, if you read on, it says, and this fruit is turned into thanksgiving towards God. So what he says is, if I give a little, then I will see a little manifestation of the fruit of righteousness in my life. Now I want to say to you, that's not even a sin, and I will explain that to you. And that which will be turned again into thanksgiving by people. So a little giving is going to produce a little thanksgiving in the hearts of those that look at you, a church that made a promise long ago, they gave in chapter 8 verse 1 even what they did not have. I don't know how they get that right, but they, didn't, they gave what they did not have. The grace of God came upon them, they gave what they did not have. You made the promise, you are already rich by the grace, chapter 8 verses 9. You know the grace of God, you are already very rich. And you made the promise. So when I come to you, there are other people, there's excitement about this thing, and we want to see the fruit of your righteousness. So if you do this properly, we will see proper fruit. Amen. So I don't b believe that scripture speaks of sowing money to get more money. Because there's so many verses, there's three places, one place in chapter 8, two places in chapter 9, where he says that grace is what enriches you financially. And not to be gracious towards people to give the grace of God that he was rich and he became poor. The fact that he gives to you is what makes you rich. Not the fact that you give. The fact that he gives. His giving makes you rich. Your giving can make another man rich. Your giving doesn't make you rich. His giving makes you rich. Okay. So I see that sowing and reaping as simply you are, it, 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 is, it is living the Christian life. Let, let God live in you. Let it be in abundance. Now listen to what he says, and he qualifies. That's why when he said, listen, um, and, and he like, he doesn't want to, he does, he's not correcting himself, he's simply explaining. He's saying, but I say to you, he which sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. And now it comes all of a sudden, and now he explains how we give. Every man according as he purposes in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So all of a sudden he said something. He said, listen, I want to tell you, you give this money that you promised. He, he didn't come to them, listen church, you know there's a need over there, let me talk to you, come and sponsor this. No, no, no. They first promised. Then he went back on their promise and said to them, listen, you guys promised me. And he would, I believe he wouldn't even have done that if the other churches didn't give. He would have just left it. Because money is too big issue in the hearts of people. And he said, I, I worked. Go and read other places of Corinthians. I worked, lest I be a stumbling block for the gospel. This man loved the preaching of the word. He, he was not into money people. He was not. The fruit of righteousness was, let me give. And we're going to end off with that scripture now. It's, it's let, let me give, you know, towards the church. Let me give towards people. Let me spend towards people. They can be blessed. 
So let me tell you, that man, Paul, that, that, that doesn't believe in you do to get, you do to be blessed, or any law, is not all of a sudden, in the area of finances, going to come now and implement a system that contradicts the cross. He's not going to do that. So I just believe, and this is what I tell you, um, that's in my heart, when he talks about sowing and reaping there, he talks about the, 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 the sowing of finances and the reaping or the abounding of the fruit onto our account, which is the fruit of our righteousness. Which is, listen to, to me, not taken in account by God saying, well, he's got so much fruit, but it's taken in account by people that are in need. For they need money, man. They need stuff. Hallelujah. Okay, so go and study that out. That just makes gospel sense to me. That makes gospel sense to me. You know, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. So what gives you all sufficiency in all things? Your sowing? No, no. God's grace. God's grace. And he said that in verse 8, and he was just saying in chapter 6, that if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you give bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. That does not speak of his, their financial provision. Because then he's contradicting himself in, in verse 8. And then he explains what he was saying, as it's written. As it is written. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. Talks about righteousness before people, taken from a scripture in Proverbs. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both changes that into food for you, and he multiplies your seed sown. He makes by grace, he works in you to even give more. Why? And in that way, increase the fruit of your righteousness. And then he says, my brethren, be enriched in everything. He what he was actually saying to them is, listen, you guys are rich in money, but you are poor in the fruit of righteousness when it comes to giving. And these other people in Macedonia, they were poor in money, but they were rich in the fruit of righteousness. And I want you to be enriched in all areas. If you're going to give a lot, we're going to see a lot of enrichment. But please, don't say, well, I'm now going to even have fruit of righteousness by my works now. Let this be a fruit of the revelation of grace that is inside your heart that makes you give. I hope you hear what I'm trying to say. This is a very difficult, it's a very easy passage to preach on if there's not so much legalism in our minds. But if there's legalism in our minds, it's a very difficult thing to preach on. Because that, that yamar, you know, yes, but, is always in our minds. Butting like a goat. It's just yes, but, yes, but. No, 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 listen. This is what he said. Let me go through this again. He said, you promised other people was, were, were inspired. We're going to come to you to receive this. You've never given. It's a year now. And I'm scared they're going to come with he was even willing to hide their sin, man, or hide their lie. But if they come with, what are we going to say? Not that they will be ashamed, but I'm going to be ashamed, man. So, well, guys, so they, therefore we send these people to take up this, this money and the stuff that you've promised. Now, remember, he that gives sparingly will reap sparingly. He that gives bountifully will reap bountifully. But let me tell you, let me explain this. He tries to explain now. This, is, this thing doesn't, you're not now going to work up fruit before God by giving a lot. This way of giving is not by my works so that I can have fruit before God. This is God giving you more grace. So, because the only fruit that counts before God is the fruit that flows from the perspective of grace. Okay, so now, but my God is able. So listen, if you guys just give a little, and you are so rich, these people, we're going to see a little bit of fruit of righteousness. But don't worry now, don't go and force yourself now. My God is able to make all grace abound unto you. And as he takes uh, wheat and he turns it into bread, in the same way he can turn your finances into a fruit of righteousness. 
So he increases your giving by his grace, by supplying by his grace for you. And then out of abundance of your heart, you give towards people and there's a good report about you and great praise. We are reaping a lot of praise before God from the people that are receiving this gift. Amen. I don't know what you think of that, Francois, but that's what I see in that scripture. <clears throat> I have never heard it preached like that, so it's just me and God at the moment and maybe some of you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> <laughs> Amen. I'm, I want to end off with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now people, Paul cannot come and contradict all that he said by implementing the sowing and reaping principle as we always have been taught. Now I can understand that if you've got a legalistic mind that it will be very difficult to understand that scripture. And I want to say this to you. If you don't understand that right now, that's fine. Man. Go, because no revelation can be forced onto anybody. It comes by the Holy Spirit. So maybe you need to, to hear some other things about the wonderful character of God that will open your heart to understand that. But I tell you now, that is, that's really what it is. <clears throat> 